America's Gilded Age, 1870 to 1890, Chapter 16. We're going to open with a picture of the Statue of Liberty, which was in 1886, a gift from France. It meant to celebrate the friendship between us and the United Press and France, and of course the triumph of freedom in the Civil War. It was dedicated in New York Harbor. The statue, statue came to well, welcome generations of immigrants to the United States, and it came to symbolize the American freedom. But 1886 also saw one of the greatest waves of strikes and labor protests and violence in our nation's history. Events which will expose deep social divisions in an industrializing society. And the question of what social conditions enable freedom and what role the government should play in defining and protecting the rights of her citizens began to take center stage. In the late 19th century, the U.S. experienced perhaps the fastest and most far-reaching economic revolution in history. Abundant natural resources, a growing labor supply, and a market for manufactured goods, plus new capital for investment, all fostered massive economic expansion. The federal government also spurred industrial and agricultural development by enacting tariffs to protect the U.S. industry from all those foreign competitions. And they gave land to railroads, and they used the army to remove Indians from western lands, which were wanted by, of course, farmers and mining companies. This is a chart to show you how much we had grown from 1870 to 1920, and you'll notice that everything increased except farming, and that decreased. Every region of our country except the South saw a rapid expansion of manufacturing and mining and rubber construction which ended in earlier America based on small farms and artisan workshops. By 1913, the United States produced a third of the world's entire industrial output. And half of all industrial workers labored in plants with more than 250 employees. By 1890, two thirds of our American workers worked for wages, which made dreams of economic independence and maybe owning your own farm or business kind of unattainable. In 1870 and 1920, a new working class developed, with 11 million Americans moving from the farms to the city, and 25 more million immigrants coming in from overseas. And most new jobs were in industrial cities, whose rapid growth was best symbolized by, of course, New York, a city whose banks and stock exchanges financed the railroads and the mines and factories and sponsored industrialization and westward expansion. The Great Lakes region was also a center of industrialization with iron and steel, machinery and chemicals, and food production in larger cities like Pittsburgh and Chicago, and of course countless smaller areas. But the railroads, ah, the railroads, it enabled what we call the second industrial revolution. They were the first, the leaders. Uh, because of them, we have time zones. Because of them, we have divisions of labor. But private investments and huge land grants and money by federal government, state government, and local governments tripled the number of miles of railroad between 1860 and 1880, and then tripled it again over the next 40 years. Of course, this opened vast new markets and areas of commercial farming and created a new national market for manufactured goods. And by the 1890s, five transcontinental railroads carried western mine, farm, ranch, and forest products back to the east where it would be manufactured into sellable goods and a lot of times shipped back to the west. I remember when we lived in Alaska, I always thought it was so funny. We would catch the salmon in Alaska, ship it to Washington State to be processed, and then ship back to Anchorage, Alaska for us to purchase. Silly. The railroads were critical to the economic growth and the national market, and any financial crisis, any crack anywhere along the line, and the entire national industry, national economy is going to be affected. This is a slide showing that we peaked in 1880 and by 1940 in World War II, uh, we weren't transporting manufactured goods, we were transporting passengers more than anything else. And this just shows the spaghetti of networks we've got all over across the nation. And even now you can go down the street and cross a railroad, but you see very little traffic. An expanding population became an ever larger market for mass production and mass distribution and mass marketing of all goods, and all of which are the basis of modern industrial economy. 
national brands, national stores, and mail order firms such as Sears Roebuck and even Montgomery Ward emerged for the first time. Extraordinary technological innovations have quickened communication and economic expansion. Telegraph lines crossed the Atlantic to Europe. Well, really not crossed the Atlantic, there were more transoceanic lines underwater. And then we have the telephone and the typewriter, which was the mother of invention for our quantum computers because of the keyboard. We have the handheld camera, which began to be used in the 1870s and 1880s. And ah, Thomas A. Edison, thank heavens we had him. He revolutionized things, such as the photograph and the light bulb and the motion picture industry. And our private life, as well as our public entertainment, was upgraded considerably. And it also contributed to our economics because it created jobs. Edison also created systems for distributing electric power. And very soon, entire cities had electricity for homes and factories and streetcars. This new electricity enabled industrial and urban growth by providing a more dependable and useful source of power than plain water or steam. The newly invented electric motor and harnesses power, and industry and households benefited even more. Ah, the copy of the 18. 97th Sears catalog. Uh, the first catalog that came out was more like a, just a single sheet of paper listing products they had to sell. But I remember as a child when we lived on the farm, and we looked so forward to the new arrival of the new uh, Sears catalog. And when we'd come in, we'd all sit down at the table and we'd go through it. And we called it our wish book because we'd sit there and wish we could buy this and wish we could buy that. It was marvelous. You could order things and didn't have to pay for them until they got there. And of course, you take the old last year's catalog and put it out in the <coughs> ready to use for toilet paper. And well, you didn't use the colored sheets though, because they scratched too much. The economic growth was remarkable, but it, it was really volatile. And with markets inundated by goods and federal money, politics removed money from the national economy and reduced prices. Now, that's good for the customer, bad for the businessman. So a series of economic recessions and depressions occurred notably in the 1870s and 1890s. Businesses began to compete ruthlessly. And in order to stabilize, price, stabilize prices and markets, the railroads and the other companies got together and formed pools to divide the markets and fix prices. And trusts were formed that allowed a single director to manage affairs of several competing companies. But the drive to compete very quickly disintegrated into schemes. And competition led some firms to control their entire industry by buying out the competition. Economic concentration culminated in the great merger wave from 1897 to 1904, in which more than 4,000 companies were incorporated into larger corporations that served national markets and thus wielded immense power. Uh, an example I usually like to give here is I'm living in Charleston and I own a fishing business where I go out and I get shrimp and whatever can get out of the ocean. But I've got a lot of competition out there and I don't like it. So I managed to borrow enough money from bankers to buy up all the other fishing boats that are fishing out there. So pretty soon I own all the boats that are fishing. So if you want to buy shrimp or mussels or anything to eat, you're going to have to buy them through me. In other words, I have merged big time and I now own the monopoly. And giant corporations begin to appear such as Standard Oil, the International Harvester, U.S. Steel, and which was incidentally founded in 1901 by financier J.P. Morgan, who took eight large steel firms and combined them into one, making a mammoth, mammoth steel company. And with no personal or corporate income tax, some businessmen managed to accumulate massive wealth and wielded economic power. And one such captain of industry is a name I'm sure all, all of you know is Andrew Carnegie. But you may not know very much about him. He was an immigrant from Scotland, he came as a teenager, he worked at a factory, he worked as a telegraph operator, and he got a position with Pennsylvania Railroad and used his savings and knowledge to build a steel empire, hard worker, good investor. And during the 1870s depression, Carnegie built a vertically integrated steel company. Now that's a, you need to know what that is and what it means. It simply means you control every stage of the business from the raw materials coming out of the ground to transportation to the factories to refine them or work them to transportation going to the market to sell them and you own the market. You own everything from beginning to end. And by the 1890s, 
Carnegie dominated the steel industry and amassed a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Now that's in the 1890s, folks. You mean that'd be trillions today. His steel factories at Homestead, Pennsylvania were the most technologically advanced in the world. Now, although Carnegie's upbringing had instilled in him the commitment of democracy and social equality and charity, he ran his factory ruthlessly. And this is just an example of, you can see there how they're concentrated in Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Was he's, he's refining the coal and the railroads, everything up in that area he owns and controls. It's vertically integrated. But more associated with extraordinary wealth seems to be John D. Rockefeller. And you hear the expression every now and then, he's rich as John D. He rose from being a merchant clerk to become an oil industry titan. And using cut through competition, he managed to ruin rival oil companies. He worked and arranged deals with railroads and he fixed prices in production. He mastered what's called horizontal integration, in which one company acquires competing firms, like I said, said senior, uh, a few minutes ago about a rallied here in Charleston and bought all the fishing boats. But he soon established a vertically integrated company, too. In other words, he went, <laughs> he owned everything he could get his hands on. He controlled the drilling, the refining, the storage, the distribution of oil. And by the 1880s, Rockefeller Standard Oil Company controlled more than 90% of the American oil industry. That was a mouth of folks. Now, these figures, these wealthy men, which we come back to called Robert Barons, they were admired and resented by Americans. And while most of them had risen from modest circumstances, their wealth and their methods of treating more their workers and conducting business, it began to alienate the Americans who were thinking, gosh, you know, all this unregulated action, it's eroding political and economic freedom, and it's, it's really damaging our democracy. In the book, Wealth Against Commonwealth in 1894, um, Henry Dean Lloyd wrote an expose of the Standard Oil explaining how he had bribed the legislatures and manipulated the markets and everything he could to get hold of it. And he also wrote in there, which is a good standard, if you remember, liberty and democracy cannot live together. But the benefits of economic expansion were distributed. <laughs> I think your text says highly unevenly. Uh, that's being mildly. A few workers, and that usually including the skilled workers, was they had some control over the production process, and these were usually miners and iron and steel workers, and they earned high wages. Both industrial workers, however, uh, they're skilled, semi-skilled, they had semi-skilled jobs. They'd be like working on the line. You stand on the line and you do the same thing all day long, seven days a week. The only skill that was required was managing that one machine. They have no control of the production and were easily replaced and dismissed during a strike or a common occurrence economic downturn. The first thing they do when the business starts losing money is get rid of employees. The regular and prolonged unemployment became widespread for these semi-skilled workers. I and mean, some became known as tramps, taking to the railroads and the roads and tried to search for employment elsewhere. And although American workers earn more than their European counterparts, Work was more dangerous in the U.S. We had no workman's compensation. We had no health insurance. If you lost a finger or a hand in the machine, you were just out of work. And you'd be lucky if they didn't find you because you got blood on the machine. And because of the high unemployment and the use of both public and private police, usually strikes in our country failed. So many workers who were extremely poor relied on the family to survive, and it usually depended on how many people in the family worked, how well you survived. Class distinctions are becoming more visible in this period as more Americans become middle class, and some very wealthy. And the very rich begin to retreat to their own neighborhoods and build fantastic homes or mansions or estates, whatever you want to call them, in the cities and the countryside. And a growing number of urban middle-class professionals, the office workers, the professional trained people, the small businessmen, they moved to urban or suburban neighborhoods and used streetcars and commuter railways to get to the central business district to work. By 1890, the richest 1% of Americans received the same total income as the bottom half of the population. And they owned more property than the remaining 99%. Many wealthy Americans, they, they lived conspicuously. They wanted to show off their money. They're no real rich. And they wanted to buy the most, the best and the most from Europe. They wanted to have an ex 
big, big mansion house. They wanted to join exclusive clubs. They wanted to send their children to exclusive colleges. And their social events were something to write about in the papers for days. But not far from the homes of these wealthy were what we call the slums of the urban poor. And I'm sure that watching documentaries on television news, seeing what's like in the slums of Mexico City or some of the countries in India where they live in shacks that are made out of paper or cardboard if they're lucky and they don't have any pastries, no running water, no electricity. Uh, but still is unimaginable. And that's what we have it just outside the larger cities, especially around Chicago in the meatpacking business. With these urban slums, well, Matthew Smith's bestseller, Sunset and Shadow, uh, began with the engraving of this. You've got the mansion on the top, and, you, you're, and just in the shadow of it, you've got the slums. Two decades later, a man called Jacob Ryle published a book of photographs called How the Other Half Lives, and he documented how the poor lived in New York. The capitalism advanced more quickly and dramatically in the Trans-Mississippi West. Now, these lands had become absorbed by white settlers, and the resources out there became available for exploitation. In 1893, uh, noted historian Frederick Jackson Turner delivered a lecture called The Significance of the Frontier in American History. In that, he argued that the frontier had forged our American culture's distinctive qualities, one of individual freedom and political democracy and economic mobility. He also argued that the frontier had been a safety valve, drawing away the dissatisfied in the East and therefore mitigated social unrest. He was very influential at the time, and his idea drew on long-standing notions that the West offered economic opportunity and freedom to all newcomers. Yes, some farmers and some gold rush, min gold rush miners and some immigrants did find op economic opportunity, but there the accuracy of Turner's interpretation ended. Well, your migrants who moved to the West, they, they didn't move individually, they usually moved in groups, usually families. And the West was not an empty space. It was inhabited by Indians, it was inhabited by Hispanics, and the West was not a paradise of small farms. These people had to be dispossessed before you could have anything, and a small farm, well, it was more of an area of industrial mining, agricultural landlords, and big railroads who used Chinese contract laborers, usually slaves brought in, and until the Civil War, actually American slaves. The West was also not a single area, but it was rather and more incredibly diverse. You got the Great Mountains, Rocky Mountains to the Great Plains, you got the Desert Southwest, you got the Sierra Nevada and the very vibrant coast of the California and the Pacific Northwest. It's becoming incorporated in the United States required the federal government's intervention. The government acquired Indian land by purchase, regulated territories, and gave land and money to the farmers and the railroads and the mining companies. And despite the myth of the West's rugged individualism, the area became part of the nation only because of massive government intervention and activity. More land came into cultivation in the 30 years after the Civil War than in the previous two, two and a half centuries or 250 years. Settlers acquired farmlands through the Homestead Act and more bought land from land speculators and railroad companies that had been given public land by the federal government. Uh -huh. A vast agricultural belt growing wheat and corn for national and international markets emerged in the middle border. In the, the, those states call them uh, middle border, the Minnesota, the Dakotas, Nebraska, and Kansas. We call them the corn belt now, or the wheat belt, where the grains are grown. And they had a very diverse population of farmers who had come in from the east, the south, and Europe. And farming in this region was extremely difficult. They didn't do a lot of dry farming. The land was flat and hot and very little rain. And then when it did rain, it poured. But much of the burden of living out in this area fell on the women. She faced severe isolation and sometimes would go months and sometimes even years without seeing anyone other than her family. This is an 1893 photograph depicting what we call a land rush. Uh, when the government says, I've got 10,000 acres out here and you can just on a certain day at a certain time, you can go out there and stake your land claim. And these people would bunch up and when a certain time went off and the shot would be fired, they would rush out. And people got hurt, people got killed. Some people got land, some people didn't get land. It was a mess, mess, mess. 
like I said, the uh, middle borders arid land required irrigation because it didn't rain much and made family farming visible. But despite the emergence of a few large what we call bonanza farms that had thousands of acres and hundreds of agricultural wage workers, family farms prevailed for a while. And these farms increasingly grew for the, for the nation and international markets and specialized in one crop. And we know what happens when you depend on a one crop. Look what happens to South when the cotton prices drop. Look what happened in Kentucky which depended on tobacco when the price of tobacco dropped. When you've just got one crop, you're setting yourself up for a, a big problem. In good days, when the prices are up, you make tons of money. But when the prices drop, you lose your shirt. Railroads brought back their goods to the rural farmers who became more and more dependent on banks for loans, machinery, and products, and subject to the ups and downs of the international agriculture prices. Now, just a little side note, my father-in-law owned what we call a truck farm in Kansas. He specialized in two crops, watermelon and cantaloupe. It was just a small 45-acre farm. That's all they grew. Uh, of course, they had their private garden where they had fruit trees, and if they didn't grow it, they didn't eat it. He had, oh, up until, I guess, the middle 50s, all he had was, you know, his two left legs. That's all he used to, to harvest and to set things up. And, of course, he had four sons he used. And in 1952, I guess it was, um, my husband, who was a young man at the time, used the money he'd earned working around and bought his dad an old Ford tractor. All it had was a four wheels and made on metal. It looked like hell, but it was better than walking. He made money every year. He managed to pay that farm off in 15 years just from what they earned from selling the water on the camera. And right next to him, his daughter, my husband's sister, they had a 500 acre farm they grew wheat and uh, had a cattle, they, not cattle, they had, did a milk, had milk cattle. They had tractors that were boxed in, air conditioned, humongous tractors, take a 40 acre field and just to turn them around in. They had the piped in music, the seats that what they call balsam seats that bounce up and down. It was beautiful. Every year they had to go to the bank to borrow money. And at the end of the season, they had to take all the profits they made back to the bank and borrow some more money. Uh, very made very little money just kind of kept their nose above water because they didn't they had to have all the luxuries and this when you're making money and things look good the banks are only too eager to loan you money and whereas pop was smart enough he didn't want to own the bank any money except for the farm he never borrowed a dime to my knowledge uh, his daughter being a businesswoman and knows the company operates on credit continually in debt for hundreds of thousands of dollars and seemed to think nothing of it so the American farmer is becoming more and more dependent on the banks who, and they're becoming part of a world market. And when there's a crisis, even overseas, it will affect the prices at home. Here's it. Now, this picture, I find it quite interesting. It's a farm in Nebraska, and as you can see, it's flat, flat, flat. And they got some horses and they got some cattle out here. And here's some mules that are going, and what is that? Unless I miss my guess, that's an old player organ, a piano. Now, what in the name of heaven is it doing sitting out in the middle of the field in Nebraska? Does the mother and the children get together and sing to the men as they're doing their work? Are they getting ready to move it to sell it? I just don't. If it wasn't for this, I'd think it was just a picture of the farm. But this just fascinates the living daylights out of me. What is it doing there? Hmm. There's going to be talk of uh, people different as a different classes. I just placed my notes. Okay, here they are. Okay. The Western farmers, their future was bound up with agricultural and using irrigation and chemicals and machines. Like I said, they all required capital investment beyond the means of most of the small farmers. And especially in California, this was evident, where huge fruit and vegetable farms owned by large corporations were worked by migrant workers from China and brought in at some time not at their choice, the Philippines, Japan, and Mexico, and they never expected to own their own land. 
cornucopia of the world. Looks good. And I've, I've lived out there a couple of years. And they do have some great vegetables. You can get them most year round. Yeah. The decades after the Civil War also saw the golden age of cattle ranching and cowboys. And railroad stations at Abilene, Dodge City, and Wichita, Kansas became destinations for now legendary cattle drives from Texas. And the cowboys who worked the drives, a very diverse group of whites, Mexicans, and black men, became icons of freedom and were immortalized in fiction and film. Do you ever stop to think where you get the term cowboy? Well, in the Deep South before the Civil War, a uh, boy was a derogatory term that the whites used against the African Americans. And in the beginning, it was the slaves, of course, who moved the cattle. So if you were a black man out there working cattle, you were a cowboy. And later it came to mean anyone who worked cattle, whether it was Mexican, black, or white. And there was a lot of Hispanics and blacks out there. And their life was far from romantic. They were very low paid wage workers. And those long distance cattle drives were horrible. Hot and dry. You could get bit by a rattlesnake. You could run out of food. The cattle could stampede. It was not an easy life. But by the 1880s, uh, we start to see the farmers trying to fence in the land with barbed wire. And we had some bad winters that killed millions of cattle. And the small cattle industry kind of disappeared. And the large industry began to reappear, dominated by huge ranches close to the railroads for transportation. Now the West had already been changed and the American Indian had, had their lives changed simply by the increase or an introduction of a train and by migrants. And by the early 19th century, the great tribes of the plains began to appear. We had the Cheyenne, the Comanche, the Crow, the Kiowa, and Sioux. And of course, a lot of them had been forcibly moved from the southeast, like trail of tears by President Jackson. And most whites moving to the Pacific Coast experienced very little hostility in the beginning from the Plains Indians. Indians. But by the 1850s, and the settlement of land, and the Indians realized these people are here to stay, you begin to see bloody conflict. Now, though President Grant declared a peace policy in 1869, Warfare between the whites and the Indians soon resumed. And Civil War generals like Philip Sheridan attacked the basis of the Indian economy by destroying villages and killing horses and buffalo. They were supposed to end the Indian resistance. Now, the buffalo, that was the tragic thing because that was their way of life. They used the meat for eating, they used the skin for clothes and tent, they used the hair of the animal for thread to make things. They used the, any if there was any horns or something hard or bones they would use for tools. It was just their mainstay. And by the 1880s, army campaigns and buffalo hunters, they nearly eradicated the buffalo of the West, which was the death of food for preservation for the Indian. And here's just a, see, if we can't get it, we'll run you off. Uh, the government's going to sell you some land that used to be Indian land. This is just a little map showing how we started putting them on reservations. As you see, they're all over the West. The army subjugated one tribe after another. In 1877, the U.S. troops under former Freedmen Bureau Commissioner o. o. Howard forced, forced the Nez Perez to surrender and relocate from Oregon, a beautiful area of the country with oceans and rivers and streams and mountains and green trees, and forced them to move to Oklahoma on a reservation. Now, folks, I've lived in Oklahoma. Now, maybe you've been, it's flat, it's hot, there's nothing there. Two years later, Chief Joseph, that tribe's leader, delivered a speech in Washington to President Rutherford B. Hayes and other notables protesting the reservation policy. And he used the language of freedom strengthened by the Civil War in Reconstruction. And it bears being said out loud. Let me be a free man, free to travel, free to stop, free to work, free to trade where I choose, and free to choose my own teachers, free to follow the religion of my father's free to think and talk and act for myself. The Indian, although contrary to what some whites believe, were not stupid. They were very forceful lawyers, lawyers, and sometimes they afflicted great costs, I guess you'd say, on American forces. And of course, the one that comes to mind to all of you is the Little Bighorn in 1876. 
where the Sioux and the Cheyenne warriors led by Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse killed General George Custer and 250 of his men. Now, just a moment side to that. Uh, up until, I guess, the 1980s, late 80s, whatever history was taught, it was taught from a 150% viewpoint of American nationalism. And I always thought it was terrible that those dastardly Indians had snuck on General Custer, a Civil War hero, and killed him. But Custer was not a nice man. Custer wanted to run for president in the next election. He was very daring. He did not mind sacrificing his troops to win an objective, and people either loved him or hated him. And there was more people getting to hate him than anything else. He was very lucky. Very lucky. And I'm sure that we've all seen the picture of him in some bars with him on a horse rearing back and his long bomb hair flowing surrounded by Indians. Well, number one, he had a very short haircut when this happened, and you would not fight Indians on the ground on a horse. It was very romantic, but not true. And he'd been given orders to stand down and wait for the rest of the army, and when he received the word there was Indians coming, and a bunch of them, he did not believe his own men. And he caused the death of himself and the other men by refusing to follow orders. Of course, we blamed the Indian, because the white man had lost and been scalped and mutilated. Apache leaders Cochise and Geronimo attacked white settlers and resisted army units well into the 1880s. They finally had to surrender. The Comanche, who had dominated other Indians in New Mexico and Colorado, they fell to the American power in the 1870s. But this resistance that they put up only temporarily delayed the advance of the white settlers and soldiers and miners. Between the end of the Civil War and 1890, eight new western states joined the Union. Nebraska and Colorado, North and South Dakota, Montana, Washington State, Idaho, and Wyoming. And the Indians were removed to reservations throughout the West, where they managed to live in poverty and were taken advantage of by traders and government agents. Now, part of the problem, number one, they're not white. Number two, they're not Christian. And number three, the biggest of all is the fact they have something we want. Bingo. And their ideas of freedom rested on preserving their cultural and political autonomy and control of their ancestral land, and which clashed considerably with the values and interests of our white Americans, who nearly all believe that the federal government should persuade or force the Plains Engine to give up their land, give up their religion, Give up this idea of communal property and their automatic way of life. Give up this gender relation, gender relations and adopt Christianity. Or become owners of private property in a small farm on a reservation where the men can work in the fields and women can work in the home the way it's supposed to be. Let me tell you something about Indian culture. The white man, when they arrived, they would find the Indian perhaps sitting under a tree smoking a pipe or out hunting and the woman working in the fields and cooking and tending the children. And they thought, this is just not right. Those men are lazy. Hunting is for the upper class. Uh, the men should be working in the fields. No. In the Indian culture, the man was the hunter. He hunted for food. He tried. He went to war. He was a politician. Labor was divided. Growing the food, uh, cleaning and cooking the meat that the men brought in and raising the children, this was the woman's job. And she controlled the food. If a warrior showed up and wanted something to eat and the Indian squaw had decided he had not contributed enough, she could withhold food from him. Mm -hmm. And when you control the food supply, you control a large hunk of population. Also, in most of the tribes, especially in the East, uh, the power to become chief came through the woman. The woman couldn't become chief, but you had to be a child of a certain woman to become chief. So the women had a lot of power. And they were also not getting you that sex. Uh, to them, it was something that happened and produced children. They were not racist. They might not like you because you're a different tribe, but it had nothing to do with the color of your skin or your religion. You were a person. They were very civilized in some ways that we Americans, white Americans, were not. But they were outnumbered by us. In 1871, Congress ended the treaty system in which the government had negotiated agreements to the Indian tribes, looking at them as independent nations, and they're going to have this land till the sun stops shining and the water starts, stops flowing in the rivers. Uh, we want land. 
and the Bureau of Indian Affairs established boarding schools where young Indian children were taken from their parents, taken away from their tribe, were given new names, and educated in the white man's ways. An example, on the left, we have the Indian customs with the long hair and the Indian moccasins. On the right, they've been put in, shall we say, white man's clothes and had their hair cut. Now they're acceptable. But they still have a problem. The skin's not white. In 1887, something called the Dawes Act was passed, which took the lands of nearly all the tribes and broke it into small parcels of land to be given back to the Indian families, and well, a part of it. But the rest of the land was going to be sold to white buyers. And Indians who accepted these farms and adopted the habits of civilized life would be offered American citizenship. And through the policy led to the loss of much tribal land and the erosion of the Indian culture traditions, Whites benefited enormously, taking most of the best Indian land, including much of Oklahoma. In the 50 years after the Dawes Act passage, Indians lost more than 86 million acres of their land. And while many 19th century laws and treaties offered Indians the right to become citizens, very few accepted. Most Indians wanted to retain their tribal identity. And the Western courts and later the Supreme Court ruled that the 14th and 15th Amendment citizenship and voting did not apply to the Native Americans. By 1900, about 53,000 Indians had become citizens by accepting the land allotments, but most Indians would not be granted citizenship. Well, if they were in World War I in 1919, they could become a citizen. But it would be five years later in 1924 when Congress finally acknowledged that all Native Americans were American citizens. In the late 1880s, uh, some Indians practiced something called a ghost dance. It was a religious movement to revitalize Indian life, kind of on the equate of us having a revival. And the ghost dance leaders predicted that one day the white man would disappear, the buffalo would return, and the Indian would resume their cultural practices free from the ills introduced by whites. Pipe dream, folks, we know it. I think they really knew it too, but they were hoping and large numbers of Indians gathered for the singing, dancing, and religious ceremonies. And the government hearing about, it, oh my gosh, that many Indians in one place, they're going to start a revolt. Oh, it's going to be trouble. So the first thing they did was round up troops and send them to the reservation where they opened fire on ghost dancers, especially the wounded Knee Creek in South Dakota. Killing as many as 200 Indians, mostly women and children. And the massacre at Wounded Knee ended four centuries of armed conflict between the Native Americans and European settlers. And Americans in this period were happy to see the Indian population down, down to a mere 250,000. Fortunately for them, they did survive and their numbers did start growing in the 20th century. But the conquest of the West was part of a worldwide movement and phenomenon. We had people coming into the interior of different regions in a nice climates all over the globe, bringing with them the way they grew crops and the type of crops they had and livestock, starting businesses and mining and farming. Places like Argentina and Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States. And they're thus called settler societies. Because immigrants from overseas rapidly outnumbered and displaced the original inhabitants. Well, it didn't happen in India or some places in Africa where the Europeans were not able to dominate entire societies, but it did in these particular places, settler societies. Now we're getting to the heart. When 1870 and 1890 is the only time in American history that's described in a rather derogatory way. It's called the Gilded Age, after the title of an 1873 novel co-authored by our famous Mark Twain. Now, gilded means simply you're covered with a layer of gold, suggesting that the golden surface is obscuring something of real value. But in reality, it is just deceptively obscuring a core of something of very little value. The Golden Age thus referred to the extraordinary economic growth of the period and the corruption caused by corporate domination of politics, as well as the oppression of others in the competition for riches. During this period, Americans, in a world in which very few European governments extended universal male suffrage, saw their nation as a beacon of democracy. Yet, 
the power of the corporations and seeing what they remove from the democratic controls, we started raising questions in our belief that political freedom meant popular self-government. Political corruption was perversy. A new railroad corporation wielding great influence in a state legislature and often legislators in the West held stock or directed mining and lumber companies. Urban politics was often dominated by corrupt political machines such as the Tweed Ring in New York, led by the boss William M. Tweed. And both robbed the city of millions of dollars and built alliances with the businessmen and labor and provided an aid to the urban poor and unemployment, as strange as it may seem. Um, this was a way of gaining their loyalty and their vote. I'll help you find a job, I'll help you find housing, and all you have to do is be loyal to me and vote for me. In national politics, many lawmakers forged bills benefiting the companies in which they had invested, from which they were receiving stock or salaries. Now, unfortunately, I don't know what happened to this slide. Uh, it's supposed to tell you about the face, famous cases of corruption during the Grant administration. The Credit Mobler scandal, a corporation formed by the Union Pacific Railroad stockholders, made contracts with itself as government expense and produced profits, and gave stock to influential politicians. And the whiskey ring, in which the Grant administration unified Republican officials, tax collectors, and whiskey manufacturers in a scheme to defraud the federal government of millions of tax dollars. Uh, this, I apologize. Um, I'm not going to re-report the whole thing because one slide is missing. The bosses in the Senate and the background fat cats is what they're called, and they're sitting there lowering it over the elected legislatures. The Civil War's legacy, well, it shaped our national politics and elections, of course. The Republicans found support in the North, the Midwest, and the Agrarian West, and among members of the revivalist churches, the Protestant immigrants, and the Blacks. Of course, the newly freed blacks would want to join to the party of Lincoln. They also had union veterans organizations, and were, it was a very strong base. And by the 1890s, pensions for union soldiers and their widows and children was the largest item in the federal budget. In 1877, Democrats dominated the South, Redeemers, remember, and found support among Catholics, especially Irish Americans in the cities. And part of that is because the Republicans were known as a party of morality and they were trying to outlaw drinking and Democrats love to drink but the parties were closely divided and in most presidential elections between 1876 and 1892 the margin separating the candidates for winning or losing was less than one percent of the popular vote. In 1874 Democrats won control of the House of Representatives and this started a period of what we call political stalemate in which little new legislation was passed for almost 20 years only briefly did either party control both the Congress and the White House, and a series of one-term presidents followed. You got Rutherford B. Hayes, which was the first one after Grant. You had James A. Garfield, his fifth successor, who was assassinated, and his Arthur became president on his assassination. You had Glover Cleveland in 1884, a good Democrat. Benjamin Harrison right after him, and then Cleveland again. Cleveland has the distinction of being the only president to have two, two uh, terms, but not consecutive. The American contest had one of the highest voting percentages we've ever had before and will ever have again. And that's good. The political cartoon showing Cleveland leading the Democratic Party. He's a little bit heavier than that's showing him. You can see the southern states voted solid Democrat. The blue voted kind of irregularly. You know, that's what's surprising because usually New York State is in the green Democratic area, but she's not during this time period. California, Nevada, and New York and Illinois are, ah, yeah, we'll vote, we won't vote. The pink is lesser than the green, however, the population is higher in the pink areas than the green areas. The political structure could not effectively control rapid growth and economic transformation. Because the federal government remained small and had very limited regulatory powers, especially compared to today, and both parties became controlled by party managers closely aligned with the business interests. Republicans supported a high tariff to protect our American industry and pursued a fiscal policy based on reducing government spending, paying off the nation's debt, 
and withdrawing from circulation all the greenbacks, which is the paper money issued during the Civil War. The Democrats opposed the high tariff, but because the leadership was still tied to the New York banks and finance, they opposed demands from their agriculture base for an increase in the money supply. In 1879, the U.S. returned to the gold standard. Paper currency could again be exchanged for gold at a fixed rate. The Republican economic policies, which reduced foreign competition in manufacturing and left banks, not the government, to regulate the money supply, favored the Eastern investors. And banks and disadvantaged Southerners and Western farmers who had to pay high prices for factory goods while the prices of their crops dropped. It's during this time we're going to get a little bit more into the gold and silver standard war very shortly. There were a few reforms in the Gilded Age. The Civil Service Act was substituted a merit system for federal employees, which replaced political appointment with competitive examination. They had been a spoils appointment. In other words, if you vote for me, I'll make you a member of my staff afterwards. In 1887, responding to protests against unfair railroad practices, Congress created the Interstate Commerce Commission to ensure that rates charged to farmers and merchants were reasonable. It makes sense. The ICC was the first federal agency to regulate the economy, but it could not set rates and thus had little effect. Although Congress didn't pass the Sherman Antitrust Act, which banned combinations and practices restraining free trade, its language was so vague, its laws couldn't be enforced, and it also had little effect. Although national politics offered few solutions to economic problems, politics was very vibrant and fluid at the state and local levels, not so much the uh, federal levels. And after the Civil War, northern state governments began to expand their role in the economy by launching massive public work programs. They created jobs, that's good. And they assumed more responsibility for public health and education and welfare, that's good. And third parties experienced some success, but they're not lasting. The Greenback Labor Party, which proposed that the federal government keep all the greenbacks in circulation, thus leaving money for investment and giving the government control over the money supply, led some to some government changes in the 1870s. But the protest over railroad among the farmers and local merchants said they were suffering very high freight rates, led to the formation of something called the Patrons of Husbandry, known as the Grange. It was founded in 1867, and the Grange established cooperatives for storing and marketing farm goods in order to force railroads to lower their prices. In some states, the Grange pressured state legislators to investigate railroad rates and regulate. And the resurgent labor movement also called for economic regulations in the form of eight-hour workdays and limit the number of workdays. Now, a few state legislators did pass these laws, but they didn't have any means of enforcement, and they had to look back. And as the nation begins to industrialize, Americans try to understand the ways in which their society and culture is changing. Debates over political economy engage millions, and not just the economists or the politicians or the academic, you and me, common folk. And there were thousands of books and pamphlets were published regarding the ethical and social consequences of the industrialization and the highly technical issues such as possible currency reform and land taxation, and that did cause the common folk problems. Many Americans believe that something was terribly wrong in the nation's social development, and they start talking about the better classes and the dangerous classes. But what are they? And because the rule as labor strife was recurrent, a number of states and even Congress established committees to investigate the changing relationship between labor and capital. And some were so shocked to learn that the employers and the employees, they didn't trust each other. And the employees are constantly complaining of abuse and poverty. Wow. Now, the emergence of a permanent class of wage earners began to challenge the traditional American ideas of freedom. Did America still offer opportunity to ordinary citizens to gain economic independence? To many, it seemed that wage labor was no longer a temporary condition on, on the way to economic freedom, nor did the West seem a refuge from the deprivation in the East. Many Americans saw the concentration of wealth in this period as natural and a sign of progress. However, and mainstream economic, economics held that wages were determined by supply and demand and should not be artificially changed by the government or labor unions. 
Hmm. That's a thinking statement. The link between freedom and equality forged in the revolution and strengthened by the Civil War no longer seems relevant. Reformers in the liberal Republican government challenged Grant in the 1872 elections and even argued that universal male suffrage was a mistake as the poor and the workers might use the vote to threaten my property. Instead, they urged a return to property qualification for the vote. And the idea that some groups were superior to others, once used to rationalize slavery, now reappeared in the scientific guise as a means to explain the success and failure of individuals and entire social classes as well as businesses. In 1859, British scientist Charles Darwin published his On the Origin of Species, in which he postulated a theory of evolution where plants and animals, thus able to adapt to their environment, supplemented those less adaptable. And different thinkers uh, simplified Darwin's theory and used the language of natural selection, the struggle of existence, and the survival of the fittest to address social problems. Now, according to this school of thought, it's termed social Darwinism. The term social Darwinism began to appear, and it was supposed to be the evolution of a natural process to both nature and society. Governments could only corrupt society by regulating the society or economy to the advantage of the poor or workers. Who were simply less able to adapt to changing conditions. Oh, okay. Makes a little bit of sense, doesn't it? Social Darwinists believed that giant corporations had evolved to become dominant in the economy because they had better adapted than to restrict their operations would be to reverse progress. The depressions of the 1870s and 1880s did not dislodge this opinion that the poor were responsible for their own poverty. Hmm. In Gilded Age America, nearly half of all local governments offered no poor relief. The only way you got help was through the church or through your family. Poverty, it was believed, was caused by a lack of character or absence of self-reliance. Ouch. Thinkers such as Yale's William Graham Sumter argued that no one in a free society could make a claim for help from any other person, including through government assistance. If you're poor, it's your own fault. You have no character. Social Darwinism helped spread a negative definition of freedom that limited government and unrestrained free markets. It became very popular among businesses and professional classes in the late 19th century. And the idea of contract was central to this definition of freedom. Labor contracts reconciled freedom and authority in the workplace. And as long as independent individuals freely contracted with each other, neither government nor unions had a right to interfere with working conditions nor could American legitimately complain that they had lost any freedom. Workers' demands that government enforce an eight-hour day or provide unemployment relief was struck the liberals as a perversion of the government authority that threatened my liberty. The old idea of free labor is a celebration of the independent small producer in a society of equality and harmony became a defense in the unrestrained capitalistic market. In other words, <laughs> if you can't make it, it's, it's my society's fault, we're not going to help you, it's your fault. The courts played an important role in making history of contract, make, I'm sorry, making liberty of contract essential to the ruling definition of freedom. The 14th Amendment allowed the federal government to overturn state laws that violated citizens' rights. That sounds right. By the 1880s, liberty of contract, not equality before the law, regardless of race, came to define the meaning of this amendment. State and federal courts regularly struck down any state laws that regulated businesses, such as the maximum hours to work, as an illegal interference with the rights of an employers to use their property as they saw fit, and the rights of the employees to choose the conditions of their work. Initially, the Supreme Court accepted laws regulating firms that represented a public interest, like the railroads, but the Supreme Court reversed itself, leading to the foundation of the Interstate Commerce Committee, ICC which lost most of its cases when they were taken to court, because the courts favored businessmen whenever they complained of a loss of economic freedom, struck down laws granting workers' rights, and limited the search the reach of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Most famously, I think your text mentions the Lautner v. New York in 1905, where the Supreme Court struck down a state law establishing maximum hours for bankers, 
arguing that it interfered with the right of contract between the employers and employees. You're going to have a division more that feeling about this. The people who've got good jobs and got money feel one way, and us poor dogs that have to scratch dirt to find, make a living, and we're going to feel another way. So public data and debate in the late 19th century, more than any other time in American history, began to divide along class lines. The shift from debates over slavery and the status of former slaves to what one politician called the overwhelming labor question became very clear in 1877 when Reconstruction ended and the first national strike began. The Great Railroad Strike. Because of a downturn in the economy, the employers of the and the employers at the railroads had cut labor by a good third to a fourth percent, and they weren't making that much to begin with. And so the workers protesting these pay cuts went on strike and paralyzed the rail traffic in much of the country. Well, of course, not listening to any arguments, the government called out the state militias to force them back to work. But when they refused to go back to work and some of the strikers had weapons, the troops started firing on the strikers and killed 20 in Pittsburgh. Well, this caused a riot. Property was burned and strikes spread to other workplaces and people began to strike in support. General strikes brought Chicago and St. Louis to an absolute halt. Well, let me stop right there and, and give you an example. Um, okay, this takes place in the East. And my husband and I live in Chicago. And he's working at a factory that makes hats. Now, we agree that these price, I mean, these wage cuts are unfair. So my husband's plant goes on strike in support of the railroad workers. And we're all for it. But with the strike paralyzing the rail traffic and no trains are coming in or out of Chicago, coal is not coming into Chicago to fire the furnaces that fuel the factories that build things. So with no coal able to keep the machines going at my husband's hat factory, the hat factory managers closed down. And since they're closed down and we do not have workers' compensation or unemployment insurance, my husband has no money. He can't get a job anywhere else because the other factories are in the same condition. They can't work. No coal. So whereas I had supported them originally, I'm starting to think, well, you know, my husband's not bringing any money. We can't pay the rent. We're going to be evicted. We're going to be on the streets. My kids can't have any milk to drink. Oh, this is not good. Those railroad people need to go back to work. You see how it progresses? I'm all for it as long as it doesn't hurt my children. And once you start getting into my pocket and hurting my kids, then I'm not going to support you. But the events did show a new solidarity among workers and close ties between the Republican Party and this new class of industrious, the employers. In the aftermath, I found it very amusing. The federal government built armories in the large major cities that would help crush any future strike by allowing the state militia to get there sooner. There was a new wave of labor organizations in the 1880s, and the Knights of Labor stood at the very center. The Knights were the first labor group <coughs> to organize unskilled workers as well as skilled as well as men, women and men, and blacks and whites, although the Knights on the West Coast did exclude the Asian immigrants. In its peak year, 1886, the Knights had around 800,000 members and involved millions of workers in strikes and boycotts and political and social and educational activities. Labor reformers in this area presented a wide range of hopes and demands, all the way from anarchism and socialism to the eight hour day and a desire for a cooperative commonwealth. Now that doesn't mean they want a commonwealth type of government. They want everybody to cooperate, basically. And they all agreed that new social conditions were highly unequal, yeah, and required drastic change. The labor movement challenged the prevailing definition of freedom as a liberty of contract, arguing that Americans had lost control over their livelihoods and their government, which was very true. Not just workers were dissatisfied with the social conditions. A sense of alarm at social changes brought on by the industrial capitalism spread through all classes. And social thinkers offered many different ideas and blueprints for change. And at the end of the 19th century, an unprecedented number of utopian novels were published, including one called Caesar's Column by Ignatius Donnelly. You do not need to remember these. In that one, civilization was joy in a brutal war between workers and businessmen. 
And the most popular books offering remedies for the unequal distribution of wealth were Progress and Poverty, Cooperative Commonwealth, and Look Backward. And all three books were bestsellers and spoke to the growing belief that the American society was deeply flawed. Now, in Rowland's book, The Cooperative Commonwealth, it was the first to popularize socialism for an American audience. Socialism, oh my. The idea that private control of economic enterprises should be replaced by government ownership in order to ensure a fair distribution of the benefits of the wealth produced. It was a major political force in Western Europe in the late 19th century, and it caused the downfall partially was the reason Russia fell, because you have two people working in the plant in Russia. They both earn the same amount of money. They both have the same job, and one of them is very proud of what he does. He, He's got no chance of, there's no competition, so he's not going to be promoted or getting a raise, but he's proud of what he does. He works good. He shows up to work and does the same thing every day. The other worker shows up once in a while, does a half bad job, doesn't care, receives the same pay. So I'm looking over there and I'm thinking, why am I working my butt off? He's getting paid the same as I am and he's not doing anything. So I may end up not doing anything too. That's the downside of socialism. But in the U.S., Private property was seen as essential to individual freedom. So socialism was usually confined to the newly arriving immigrants whose foreign languages and writings reached very few people. Rowland was the first to Americanize socialism. And while Karl Marx in Europe had predicted that socialism would be achieved through a working class revolution, you know, workers of the world unite, Rowland believed it would be achieved by a peaceful revolution and election and thus made it a little bit more accessible to middle-class Americans who were terrified by the thought of class conflict and the prospect of another revolution. Socialism was not popular like this among the early 20th century, but Roland's work performed, prepared an audience from Bellamy looking backward, which promoted socialism even as he... <laughs> well, he stopped calling it socialism and started calling it nationalism. And that sounds a little bit better. In Bellamy's, Bellamy's utopian novel, A Man Falls Asleep in 1888 and Wakes Up in the Year 2000, in a world in which cooperation had replaced class conflict and economic competition, and in which inequality and liberty, as defined by liberty of contract, had been banished. Bellamy insisted freedom was a social condition, resting on interdependence, not autonomy. His highly authoritative utopian novel, in it everyone would be constricted into a great industrial army controlled by a single government operation. Ooh, that gives me a creep just thinking about it. But it did inspire hundreds of nationalist clubs whose members sought the abundance of industrial capitalism without its inequalities. Well, everybody wants that. The clergy also became a source of criticism of social Darwinism and laissez-faire notions of freedom and laissez-faire simply means government hands off. While most Protestant preachers continued to attack individual sin, a new social gospel took shape in the writings of men like, I'm not even going to try to say his name, Walter R. something, a New York Baptist minister, and Washington Gladden, a congressional clergyman in Columbus, Ohio. They argued that freedom and a spiritual self-development required an equalization of wealth and power, and that unregulated capitalism degraded Christian brotherhood. You know, there's some truth to that. Adherents tried to administer to the needs of the urban poor. They attacked child labor and promoted better working class housing and health and safety laws, which no one's going to argue with that. The social complex of the age seemed to come to culmination in the great labor uprising of 1886, when Western Railroad Union successfully struck against lines controlled by Jay Gould, a very powerful financier and a very bad robber baron. He inspired workers to join the Knights of Labor by the hundreds of thousands, and he himself was a lot like the corporate riggers back in the 80s. He'd go in and buy up a company, rob it of all its funds, fire the workers, break it down and sell all the pieces for money. On May the 1st, 1886, 350,000 workers all across the country went on strike and protested for, protested for the eight-hour day. May the 1st became known as May Day thereafter and became an annual holiday of parades and protests by workers around the world. In Chicago, unfortunately, at the same time, they had a very vibrant labor movement brought together, unfortunately, again, radical socialists and anarchists and immigrant workers and 
some native born unhappy laborites. Not a good combination. A strike by the iron molders at the giant McCormick plant, which did, they produce agricultural machinery, turned violent. Unusual for a strike to turn violent? Not really. Company strike breakers and private police battled the strikers, and on May the 3rd, 1886, four strikers were actually killed by the police. May the 4th, next day. A rally was held at the, um, the ballot. The rally was held at the Haymarket meeting place, uh, rally, uh, Lake meeting place, to protest the death, and somehow or another it ended in a bomb explosion. To this day, no one knows for sure the identity of the bomber, although it has been suspected that it was thrown by an undercover policeman. Well, there were some policemen killed, and to this day, it, it's a horrible sight to even think about. The police opened fire, leading to the deaths and injury of many policemen and bystanders. But not only in Chicago, but elsewhere, they began to use this bombing as an opportunity to arrest and suppress anything they considered a labor radical. Of course, the McCormick strike ended in defeat, and eight anarchists from this particular explosion Mostly immigrants were charged with a bombing. With little evidence and a very flawed court proceedings, they were convicted. Four were hanged. One committed. And the remaining three were imprisoned until their sentences were commuted several years later. The Haymarket Martyrs is what they were called. And they very soon became symbols of labor's bloody struggle for the rights of workers in America. The Haymarket Affair took place in the multiple efforts across the country by workers mostly in the Knights of Labor, to run candidates and organize workers based at the local and state levels. The most celebrated campaign took place in 1886 in New York when Henry George ran for mayor on the United Labor ticket. He almost defeated the Democratic candidate. But the events of 1886 and that Haymarket massacre suggested that labor might become a powerful political force. And it very began to look like we might be having a permanent condition of unrest and hatred and maybe all-out war between capitalists and laborers. In fact, the Knights of Labor began to decline after this because it was too much associated with the Haymarket Massacre. Unions began to avoid politics and the Democrats and Republicans proved successful at winning workers' votes. And along comes the another labor organization, AFL. Nevertheless, the events of the Gilded Age marked a contest over freedom and its social conditions between the forces of social Darwinism and laissez-faire industrial freedom. In summing the Gilded Age up, it bears repeating. The events of this time marked a contest over freedom and the social conditions were hit, which had been deteriorating. And I do have a list, uh, a document, I meant to put it in the PowerPoint and forgot, of the businesses that were affected by the industrialization. I think there's seven of them, and I gave you like 12 reasons, good and bad, the results of the industrialization. It'd be a good idea to know that. But the events of the time marked a contest over freedom and the social conditions between social Darwinism and laissez-faire politics, government hands off, and those who supported collective efforts to establish industrial freedom. Now, this is the only YouTube I've got on this particular lecture, and I want you to pay close attention to it. Uh, it's our illustrious Mr. Green who's going to amuse you and confuse you a little bit. But he gives you some very good information about railroads and their contribution to our society. And there will be questions regarding that. Oh, but we do got advertising. Four, three, two... One, here we go. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course U.S. History, and today we're going to discuss economics and how a generation of... Mr. Green, Mr. Green, is this going to be one of those boring ones with no wars or generals who have cool last words or anything? All right, Mr. Pat, I will give you a smidge of great man history, but only a smidge. So today we're going to discuss American industrialization in the decades after the Civil War, during which time the U.S. went from having per capita about a third of Great Britain's industrial output to becoming the richest and most industrialized nation on Earth. 
Yeah, you might want to hold off on that libertage, Stan, because this happened mostly thanks to the not particularly awesome Civil War, which improved the finance system by forcing the investment of the national currency and spurred industrialization by giving massive contracts to arms and clothing manufacturers. The Civil War also boosted the telegraph, which improved communication and gave birth to the Transcontinental Railway by the Pacific Railway Act of 1862, all of which increased efficiency and productivity. So thanks, Civil War. <laughs> If you want to explain America's economic growth in a nutshell, chalk it up to G, D, and L. Gerard, Depardieu, and Rohan. No, geography, demography, and law. However, while we're on the topic, when will Gerard, Depardieu, and Lindsay Rohan have a baby? Stan, can I see it? Yes! Yes! Geographically, the U.S. was a huge country with all the resources necessary for an industrial boom. Like, we had coal and iron and later oil. Initially, we had water to power our factories, later replaced by coal. And we had amber waves of grain to feed our growing population, which leads to the demography. America's population grew from 40 million in 1870 to 76 million in 1900. And a third of that growth was due to immigration, which is good for economies. Many of these immigrants flooded the burgeoning cities as America shifted from being an agrarian rural nation to being an industrial urban one. Like New York City became the center of commerce and finance and by 1898 it had a population of 3.4 million people and the industrial heartland was in the Great Lakes region. Chicago became the second largest city by 1900, Cleveland became a leader in oil refining, and Pittsburgh was the center of iron and steel production. And even today the great city of Pittsburgh still employs 53 steelers. Last but not least was the law. The Constitution and its Commerce Clause made the U.S. a single area of commerce, like a giant customs union. And, as we'll see in a bit, the Supreme Court interpreted the laws in a very business-friendly way. Also, the American Constitution protects patents, which encourages invention and innovation, or at least it used to. And despite what Ayn Rand would tell you, the American government played a role in American economic growth by putting up high tariffs, especially on steel, giving massive land grants to railroads, and by putting Native Americans on reservations. Also, foreigners played an important role. They invested their capital and involved Americans in their economic scandals, like the one that led to the Depression in 1893. The U.S. was at the time seen by Europeans as a developing economy, and investments in America offered much higher returns than those available in Europe. And the changes we're talking about here were massive. In 1880, for the first time, a majority of the workforce worked in non-farming jobs. By 1890, two-thirds of Americans worked for wages rather than farming or owning their own businesses. And by 1913, the United States produced one-third of the world's total industrial industrial output. Now bring out the Libertage, Stan. Awesome, and even better, we now get to talk about perennially underrated railroads. Let's go to the thought bubble. Although we tend to forget about them here in the U.S. because our passenger rail system sucks, railroads were one of the keys to America's 19th century industrial success. Railroads increased commerce and integrated the American market, which allowed national brands to emerge like ivory soap and A&P grocery stores. But railroads changed and improved our economy in less obvious ways, too. For instance, they gave us time zones, which were created by the major railroad companies to make shipping and passenger transport more standard. Also, because you recognize the importance of telling time, a railroad agent named Richard Warren Sears turned a $50 our investment in watches into an enormous mail order empire, and railroads made it possible for him and his eventual partner Robust to ship watches and then jewelry and then pretty much everything, including unconstructed freaking houses throughout the country. Railroads were also the first modern corporations. These companies were large, they had many employees, they spanned the country, and that meant they needed to invent organizational methods, including the middle manager, supervisors to supervise supervisors. And for the first time, the owners of a company were not always day-to-day -day managers because railroads were among the first publicly traded corporations. They needed a lot of capital to build tracks and stations, so they sold shares in the company in order to raise that money, which shares could then be bought and sold by the public. And that is how railroads created the first captains of industry, like Cornelius, they named a university after me, Vanderbilt, and Andrew, me too, Carnegie, Mellon, and Leland, I named a university after my son, Stanford. The railroad business was also emblematic of the partnership between the national government and industry. The Transcontinental Railroad, after all, wouldn't have existed without congressional legislation, federal land grants, and government-sponsored bond issues. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Apparently, it's time for the mystery document. The rules here are simple. I get the author of the mystery document, and if I'm wrong, which I usually am, I get shocked. All right. The belief is common in America that the day is at hand when corporations far greater than the Erie swaying such power as have never in world history been trusted in the hands of mere private citizens controlled by single men like Vanderbilt will ultimately succeed in directing government itself. 
Under the American form of society, there is now no authority capable of effective resistance. Corporations directing government, that's ridiculous. So grateful for federal ethanol subsidies. Brought to you by Delicious Diet Dr. Pepper. Mm. I can taste all 23 of the chemicals. Anyway, Stan, I'm pretty sure that is noted muckraker Ida Tarbell. No! Henry Adams? How are there still Adams as an American history? Oh, that makes me worry we'll never escape the Clintons. Anyway, it should have been Ida Tarbell. She has a great name. She was a great opponent of capitalism, whatever. Ah! Indeed, industrial capitalists are considered both the greatest heroes and the greatest villains of the era, which is why they are known both as captains of industry and as robber barons, depending on whether we are mad at them. While they often came from humble origins, took risks, and became very wealthy, their methods were frequently unscrupulous. I mean, they often drove competitors out of business and generally cared very little for their workers. The first of the great robber barons and or captains of industry was the aforementioned Cornelius Vanderbilt, who rose from humble beginnings in Staten Island to make a fortune in transportation through ferries and shipping, and then eventually through railroads, although he once referred to trains as them things that go on land. But the poster boy of the era was John D. Rockefeller, who started out as a clerk for a Cleveland merchant and eventually became the richest man in the world, ever. Yes, including Bill Gates. The key to Rockefeller's success was ruthlessly buying up so many rivals that by the late 1880s, Standard Oil controlled 90% of the U.S. oil industry. Which lack of competition drove the price of gasoline up to like 12 cents a gallon. So if you had one of the 20 cars in the world, then you were mad. The period also saw innovation in terms of the way industries were organized. Many of the robber barons formed pools and trusts to control prices and limit the negative effects of competition. The problem with competition is that over time, it reduces both prices and profit margins which makes it difficult to become super rich. Vertical integration was another innovation. Firms bought up all aspects of the production process, from raw materials to production to transport and distribution. Like Philip Armour's meat company bought its own rail cars to ship meat, for instance. It also bought things like conveyor belts, and when he found out that animal parts could be used to make glue, he got into the glue-making business. It was Armour who once proclaimed to use every. Horizontal integration was when big firms bought up small ones. The best example of this was Rockefeller's Standard Oil, which eventually became so big, incidentally, that the Supreme Court forced Standard Oil to be broken up into more than a dozen smaller oil companies, which, by the way, over time have slowly reunited to become the company known as ExxonMobil, so that worked out. U.S. Steel was put together by the era's giant of finance, J.P. Morgan, who, at his death, left a fortune of only $68 million, not counting the art that became the backbone of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, leading Andrew Carnegie to remark in surprise and to think he was not a rich man. Speaking of people who weren't rich, let us now praise the unsung heroes of industrialization, workers. Well, I guess you can't really call them unsung because Woody Guthrie. Oh, your guitar and my computer. I never made that connection before. Anyway, then as now, the benefits of economic growth were shared, mm, shall we say, a smidge unevenly. Prices did drop due to industrial competition, which raised the standard of living for the average American worker. In fact, it was among the highest in the world. But due to a growing population, particularly of immigrant workers, there was job insecurity, and also booms and busts meant depressions in the 1870s and 1890s, which hit the working poor the hardest. Also, laborers commonly worked 60 hours per week with no pensions or injury compensation, and the U.S. had the highest rate of industrial injuries in the world, an average of over 35,000 people per year died on the job. These conditions and the uncertainty of labor markets led to unions, which were mostly local but occasionally national. The first national union was the Knights of Labor, headed by Terrence B. Powderly, which grew from nine members in 1870 to 728,000 by 1884. The Knights of Labor admitted unskilled workers, black workers, and women, but it was irreparably damaged by the Haymarket Riot in 1886. During a strike against McCormick Harvesting Company, a policeman killed one of the strikers, and in response, there was a rally in Chicago's Haymarket Square at which a bomb killed seven police officers. Then, firing upon the crowd, the police killed four people. Seven anarchists were eventually convicted of the bombing, and although Though Powderly denounced anarchism, the public still associated the Knights of Labor with violence, and by 1902, its membership had shrunk considerably to zero. The banner of organized labor, however, was picked up by the American Federation of Labor under Samuel L. Gompers. Do all of these guys have great last names? They were more moderate than the anarchists and the socialist international workers of the world, and focused on bread and butter issues like pay, hours, and safety. Founded in 1886, the same year as the Haymarket Riot, the AFL had about 250,000 members by 1892 almost 10% of whom were iron and steel workers. And now we have to pause to briefly mention one of the most pernicious innovations of the era, social Darwinism, a perversion of Darwin's theory that would have made him throw up, although to be fair, almost everything made him throw up. Social Darwinism
economists argue that the theory of survival of the fittest should be applied to people and also that corporations were people. Ergo, big companies were big because they were fitter and we had nothing to fear from monopolies. This pseudoscience was used to argue that government shouldn't regulate business or pass laws to help poor people. It assured the rich that the poor were poor because of some inherent evolutionary flaw, thus enabling tycoons to sleep at night. You know, on a big pile of money surrounded by beautiful women. But despite the apparent inborn unfitness of workers, unions continued to grow and fight for better conditions, sometimes violently. There was violence at the Homestead Steel Strike of 1892 and the Pullman Rail Strike of 1894 when strikers were killed and a great deal of property was destroyed. To quote the historian Michael Wind, in the late 1870s and early 1880s, the United States had five times as many unionized workers as Germany at a time when the two nations had similar populations. Unions wanted the United States and its citizens to imagine freedom more broadly, arguing that without a more equal economic system, America was becoming less, not more free, even as it became more prosperous. If you're thinking that this freewheeling age of fast growth, uneven gains in prosperity, and corporate heroes slash villains resembles the early 21st century, you aren't alone. And it's worth remembering that it was only 150 years ago that modern corporations began to form and that American industry became the leading driver in the global economy. That's a blink of an eye in world history terms, and the ideas and technologies of post-Civil War America gave us the ideas that still define how we, all of us, not just Americans, think about opposites like success and failure or wealth and poverty. It's also when people began to discuss the ways in which inequality could be the opposite of freedom. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Crash Course is produced and directed by Stan Muller. Our script supervisor is Meredith Banker. The associate producer is Danica Johnson. The show is written by my high school history teacher. There we go. Give you some good information about the... Uh... Railroads. So now that you have read your chapter and listened to the lecture and listened to YouTube, you are ready for your 15 point quiz and your two essay questions. Thank you for listening.